The thing about about Credo that you have to you have to try and get is that um, you have a lot of these blocks scattered around, sort of like people, many people in a room, and um, they look like many different people, individual. They have individual personalities, like they're actually, you know, this one might be interesting, this one might be smart, this one might be boring. It's not true. They're all irrelevant, essentially, sort of like blocks. Correlation is the key, and that's what I keep telling them. You know, it it can't be loose. You wonder about things, you know, is, is this going to tie into this, is this going to tie into that, does the, does the round peg fit in the, the round hole, does the square fit in the like, the square hole. The game itself is not complicated really, it's the compact nature of the rules that, uh, that really, it pulls the game together. You stare at these blocks for a long time, and eventually you start to see, it, it, I mean it's, it's, all, it's all one thing. You can't distinguish color anymore. You can't dis distinguish shape. Eight hundred years ago, the Jewish people mourned the death of Rabbi Moses Maimonides, the illustrious Rambam. It was Maimonides who cut the precious diamond known as the 13 roots of the Jewish creed. During this octocentennial year, a group of enterprising university students turned to a mysterious etching from the Cairo Geniza to create a mind-bending challenge of faith for the 21st century. The name of the game, Credo 13. Welcome to Credo 13, I'm Michael Kegel. The second root belief in the Maimonidean Creed is that God is unique. Unique how? Unique in a way that is unique. God is one. People talk about one God. And people don't recognize why one God means anything. The idea that God is one is not just that there is no other God. Unity suggests a bunch of parts put together into a whole, or unity of one, but one is part of a series of two, three, four. Uh, God is not a unit, uh, nor a unification. God is not, I don't know, his energy, his thought, whatever, however you define him, he's not something that we could define, because if you could define him, then he would no longer be a unity. I mean, I think that the best understanding of uh, unity is, is uniqueness. Um, that God is incomparable. And he's yachid, and the, 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 and yachid is kamod. There's nothing as unique as a kashbok in the world. We say Hashem hu elokim, the Lord is God. You're saying there's a category called godliness of which there is only one member. If there were two gods, or if God was a twosome, then by definition, there would be limitation. So therefore, the klal and the prat, the, 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 the category and the individual are one and the same. So therefore, our conviction that God is limitless uh, demands that we believe that God is a unity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Which is the statement of not only one God, but that God is a simple unity. Not only is he the only one, but he is, oh, God is one. So that, for example, uh, you know, an argument like uh, all of Plato, that, uh, you know, that all, uh, um, red things are part of a larger category called redness. And this is really the key. All red things are part of a category of redness. Roses are red, and so is this red cube. But what if there were no red roses or red fire trucks, but only this one red cube? What if there were only one red thing, uh, and redness could not be said about anything else but that? then redness would be very different than the way we understand it now. In our credo drama number two, Jackie slips a red cube from her own faith structure onto Sam's all red structure, as if to challenge the posture of a homogeneous redness. The conversation turns to a recent visit. Jim came by. Jim came by here? Yep, last night. Where was I? Out. I wasn't out. You were sleeping. Jim came by. Mystery man Jim comes by, not empty-handed. He comes bearing a gift, a special appliance. As Billy informs us, it is the only one of its kind. But is that true? 
In this case, the individual fails to be a category. It's a toaster. He bought us a toaster? It's an all-in-one toaster. What's an all-in-one toaster? It does everything. What's everything for a toaster? Well, it toasts. Yes. And he bought us a toaster? It's a really nice model. It's a toaster, Billy. An all-in-one toaster. It's so much better than the average toaster. Because it does everything. Whereas the average toaster does no more than toast. Look, he didn't have to get us anything. And it's like they say, if you're already going toaster, it's you the only might... one of its kind. So it's an all-in-one of a kind toaster. That's what it says on the box. How does a 12th century creed become a challenge of faith for the 21st century? This is Credo 13. The second principle of Maimonides' creed, God's unity is absolute. When we come to certain discussions of God in the Midrashic literature, which would seem to point to there being a God, a divine presence, this attribute of God, that attribute of God in conflict with each other, and certainly later on when we get into Kabbalah, uh, there, there seems to be a discussion of of, 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 not God forbid, separate elements of the divine, but different elements of the divine. In the great debate between the philosophers and the Mekubalim, the Kabbalists, this, it came down to this principle. I think Kabbalah does run this risk. You end up having, well, there's the, the wisdom going one way and the power going another way and the mercy is here and the... Opponents of Kabbalah were universal in condemning the notion of the Sefirot, citing Maimonides, and uh, uh, you do end up dealing with a committee. In fact, not just opponents of the Kabbalah, Rabbi Abraham Abu Lafia, who himself was a great Kabbalist, he repeats an expression that we hear elsewhere, that the Kabbal he, Kabbalists, whereas the Christians have three, the Kabbalists have ten. And there's been a, a constant need by those who are concerned with the dogmas of Judaism to keep telling us that we should always interpret all these things as metaphors beyond our comprehension because the oneness of God is never lost. It's not like you have God and his attributes separate from him. It's all one. Now that doesn't mean that God will always uh, represent himself or portray himself uh, in the same way. In Jewish thought, we also speak about attributes of God. There is what is called the Midas Sadin, the attribute of strict justice. There is the Midas Harachmim, the attribute of, of mercy. Like us, we departmentalize. We have moods. In the days that we're angry, we're not happy. In the days that we're angry, we're not angry, right? And God is all, and there's, there's no real oneness. We're, all, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're different, we're scattered, we're different people. The typical understanding of God is that God, you do something, God will be angry at you. He wasn't angry before, he's angry now. Uh, what does that mean? It's interestingly, in the guide, Maimonides says that this is a, a view that the average person should have because he's not, does not able to understand more exalted understanding of God that uh, God really doesn't have anger. There certainly is this kind of plurality in our experience of God. Uh, however, and that's the, the big however, we're dealing with one personality, Kibyachal. When you begin to understand that certain that, that things come from one source, then you can't look at them as completely, totally separate and defined independently. There is the ultimate connection in the Creator. The reality is that when a person prays, um, we don't believe that there's a change in God's mind. We don't believe that um, there is an aspect of God which now is able to win over the other side. In other words, prayer really changes the person who prays. For many of the medievals, you actually pray, direct your prayers to a different uh, sphere, sphira, depending on when it is and uh, God's mercy here, and, uh, another aspect of God here. This division of God, even if you say the Kabbalists were insistent that even with the Sefirot, God's ultimate unity is not touched. But metaphorically, you can describe this as a debate going on between the various midos of God, the attribute of kindness, the attribute of justice. But in reality, um, th th there's no debate. There is no schizophrenia. There is no split personality. It's just that this issue has two different sides. And in the process of prayer, 
we become more deserving, and therefore there is room for the attribute of mercy now to override. But God has a oneness about him all the time. Even in different reactions take place, it all this love mixed with this and with that all the time. It's never, it may, be, it may see, seem to us as recipients that now we're suffering, but in the eyes of God it's not that way. It may, it may be a blessing. What seems to be anger may be love. Is that like saying what seems to be a toaster may be a fridge? Seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't memorize the thing. Some of the features? I don't remember. When he handed you the box. Yeah. And you saw that it was an all-in-one toaster. Yeah. Didn't you ask him what that meant? The gift from Jim continues to mystify as our credo aficionados mistakenly pursue monochromatic structures of belief in a kaleidoscopic spectral unity. Was there anything you noticed it couldn't do? I don't think there's anything it can't do. There must be something. I don't think so. All toasters have limitations. The all-in-one toaster is greater than the sum of its parts. What is the sum of its parts? It's not hampered by its features. What features? I don't think you guys get it, okay? The all-in-one toaster is not your average toaster. Throwing. <laughs> That's it. You like have like an attitude with the flashlight. <laughs> If there's one God, then ethics is not about the politics of the gods, trying to align yourself with this God rather than that God. Uh, it becomes a question of attaining to the kind of unity of ethical commitment uh, that one sees in the Rabban Shalom. If one would posit a dualism which saw the forces of good and evil being equally powerful and fighting with each other as you had in certain classical Near Eastern religions, then obviously there you would be positing that uh, evil is a, is a power of its own and uh, is battling with God for control of the universe, which would be antithetical to the one good, just God envisioned by Judaism. Ultimately, if God is one, then there is, uh, then everything flows from him. And therefore, I'm not going to say evil has value. I'm not trying to be as uh, Frankist or whatever on the extreme, but what I'm trying to say is, is that it's a lot more complex. Certainly, I know in later points in, in world history, when devil worship or worship of evil, a sense that evil can be a path to salvation, is something that actually uh, very recently, uh, you know, the 1890s, a lot of the sort of romantic uh, dandies and Baudelaire and Verlaine and Oscar Wilde. In certain ways, I should point this out, that even the way people discuss Satan in our general culture, it's almost like the fallen angel. They're trying to create, they're trying to deal with this problem by, by again saying the bad guy is not God. To make this very, con you know, contemporary, you know, you think of something like uh, the Doors or the Velvet Underground, and you know, certain bands like that. Uh, um, I think that you know, some of the other bands are just sort of playing with it. But I think that in the case of Morrison and and Lou Reed, maybe they weren't just playing. That there, there was a sense that one can achieve salvation through decadence. Well, Judaism doesn't have the idea of Satan either. Satan is not a fallen angel. He is an angel doing his job under the direction of God. So everything emerges from God. Oscar Wilde once said that the best place to see the stars is lying on your back in the gutter. So that uh, I think that's something that we have to be, be, be afraid of when we make evil a, a real source and a real power that we might become enamored, worship it, and follow it. The simplest and most extreme threat to the unity of God is the dualism of good and evil. The evil that God condemns must nevertheless, from a divine standpoint, be good. This must hold even for bad toast, as Billy argues. In the meantime, Jackie removes a blue pyramid from her structure, realizing that you cannot build higher 
on Egyptian tomb architecture. It never burns. What? The toaster? Yeah, it'll never burn your toast. I like burnt toast. Who likes burnt toast? Not totally burnt, just black. You like black toast? Reminds me of my first boyfriend. Was he black? No, his toaster was broken. Well, I guess it could burn the toast if you want it to. Are you sure? It's an all-in-one toaster. So I'm not quite sure what that means. It means it can burn the toast. So if you wanted bad toast, it thing. It's an all-in-one. That seems contradictory. Well, it's always the right toast, even if it's bad toast. There's something very Taoist about this toaster. Bread for you? I think so. Can it slice a bagel? I'm pretty sure. Can it untoast the bread? I don't see why. What? Let's say I toast a piece of bread and then I want it fresh again. I'm not. Can I boil an egg to go with your bread? It's just a toaster. An all in one toaster. I can it sing to you? I, I can't can't wash the dishes off you eat. That seems and a little. And let's say I really want that fresh piece of bread back. Billy's credo structure remains dubious. Four rampart like walls here, 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 and here would seem to protect her faith from external aggression. Alas, internally, the four blocks remain apart and ununified, like four gods in a pantheon who refuse to talk to each other. Depressed by her failure, she returns the mythical toaster for a refund the next morning. As a child, I was very taken by uh, Greek and uh, Norse mythology, but although I found it fascinating reading, I always hoped that that Zeus and, and, and Odin would not really be the name of the game. Why worship Zeus if you don't really, he's not the kind of person you'd want to marry your daughter? It struck me as such a, a disordered and, and evil and... Uh, Oh, just an ego-driven universe that uh, I, I, I wanted, as a, as a child not brought up in a religious home, I wanted the Old Testament stories to be the reality. You know, read the Iliad. Although I, I found the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, great fun and, and found some meaning in them, it just seemed to be depicting a universe of such, uh, such a ragged universe. The first motivation of idolatry or paganism is that we don't have the ability, they do not have the ability of saying why the god of war, how the god of war connect with the god of love. Need fertility, you talk to fertility god, you, uh, you want health, you talk to a health god, you want success in war, you talk to a war god. So you create Aphrodite like this, and you create Mars like this, and nobody like Mars anyways. So that's good. The point is you can't do it with God. It does not encourage a unified ethical conception. Love and justice and truth should be the foundation stone of, of existence and not the, the jealousies between gods. You know, Zeus and Hera are not necessarily the ideal couple. Send them to marriage counseling, but uh, uh, you know, part I think the, the polytheistic framework is one that is uh, that leads to that kind of amorality. And it was the whole presentation of the halachic system is predicated on the mitzava, the commander, um, being one and being unified. Therefore, the the the, the commands come out of the whole out of the center. It doesn't come out of any one value or one perspective. If you want to say it's not Mars' commands, it's not Aphrodite's commands, it's the command of the whole. See, what, what, what paganism did is that in a sense it tended to be a more tolerant worldview in some ways because the Greeks figured, oh, we've got our gods, you've got your gods. You know, maybe put our God in your temple, and maybe we'll put your God in our temple. And it, it, it tended to be a much more tolerant worldview than Judaism or even Christianity and Islam tended to be with their claims to absolute truth. So that um, neo-paganism has a certain allure to modern man because it allows for the other to exist. 
But Maimonides' context is really Islam and to a lesser extent Christianity, so paganism is not really the issue here. Uh, paganism, obviously it's against paganism, but uh, I don't think you need, I think Jews understood why paganism was wrong. I believe it's all the Christians' fault. Well, obviously God's oneness is called into question by the, uh, one of the major faiths in the world who uh, insists that God is, not, is one and also three and three and also one. So that here Maimonides is telling us that uh, Judaism stands and falls on the proposition that he is one and that you cannot subdivide him in any way. The Christians started with these complicated notions of attributes because the Trinity and then this infected general medieval philosophy. That's what I think. In the New Testament, we have, in fact, a conflict between God the Father and God the Son. Now, Jesus on the cross um, says that, My Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Which, uh, according to the belief of the Trinity, really is a tension between two aspects of the Godhead, God the Son and God the Father. God the Son is questioning the judgment and the decision of God the Father. And that type of uh, split personality within God, uh, Judaism rejects. It's easier for Christians to deal with the multiplicity, so to speak. And the argument has been made, and I think for this you need to uh, speak to uh, Christian scholars, that the idea of the Trinity was a concession to paganism. Now imagine trying to sell Christianity to polytheists, uh, pagans, nature worshippers, who previously um, believed in a multitude of gods, and you come to them and say that there's only one God. Uh, as crazy as it sounds to us to believe in many gods, so it must have been crazy to the polytheist that someone should propose the existence of a single god. Once you say God is one and everything falls from God, then ultimately you're also faced with the impossibility of man to really understand God and to really understand um, how everything flows from God and how everything is from the simple unity. And you are thrown into a world of mystery in relating to God. Keep building the faith with Credo 13. Join us next week for the next root belief of the Maimonidean Creed. God is incorporeal. Stay tuned for the men in black hats on messages up next. Let's put something out there. You are not playing the same game twice. Okay? That's just not happening. I mean, one of the most exciting things that we, that we, that we put into this game is that you might get a set of 75 pieces, you might get a set of, you know, 25 pieces, a set of three pieces. You don't know when you buy the set how many pieces you're getting because that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm.